All right, we are, uh, we're gonna get things started now, folks. So this is our third and our final. Brad is gonna be speaking to us uh, during our regular service tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. if you wanna tune in. It's still gonna be a part of uh, uh, a more Christ-like way. Uh, and it'll be online so you can stop in and you can get that anytime. If you've got someplace else to be tomorrow morning, it will be available at any time that you can get stop by and pick that up. Uh, also at raleighvineyard.org, or you can find the Raleigh Vineyard YouTube channel, and uh, these will all be on there as well. Uh, I think that's everything that I wanted to say, uh, at, other than the fact that we are just really grateful that Brad was able to make this time for us, and uh, that he's been able to at least virtually spend a weekend with us again. Uh, it's it's better than not at all, and so we really appreciate it. We're grateful for uh, all of uh, your your uh, insight and wisdom that you're sharing with us, and we look forward to what you're going to share with us tonight. So, turn things over to you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, everybody, a uh, round of applause in the chat for uh, Brad Jerzak. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, let's pray. So, Father in heaven, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the grace of the Holy Spirit, through whom we know that you are in us and with us. Uh, tonight, we pray that you would open the eyes of our heart to, to have a revelation of the Jesus way, the way of the cross, and the way of grace, the way of surrender, the way that you've called us to follow. And we thank you that you would never just send us forward into something you have not forged for us. And so we're grateful that you're our companion on this journey, Lord Jesus. And we, we invoke that tonight in Jesus name. Amen. So uh, tonight we are looking at uh, seven facets of the Jesus way, and I call them radicals and, and uh, radicals, a strange word. We talk about the radicalization you know, of extreme groups. But really, uh, originally, the word radicals, it's, it's related to the word roots. And so in the 16th century, when you had Protestants and Catholics battling it out, mm -hmm. you had a third group arise called the Anabaptists, who end up being uh, the, the earliest forerunners of groups like the Mennonites and so on. And they were really into the separation of church and state. They were really into peacemaking and nonviolence. Uh, they were really into, into uh, memorizing and, and following scripture for themselves, especially, especially the Sermon on the Mount, that this would become their way of life. And, uh, and one of their nicknames was the radicals. Now they were radical in that sense that, they were way outside of the status quo, but they were also radical because they, they thought of themselves as going back to the roots of the New Testament, to root themselves in the teachings of Jesus. And I have a big, thick book. It's, you know, it's probably 1,400 pages, a, a giant volume called Martyr's Mirror, just mostly about martyrdoms in the first half of the 16th century, where Catholics and Protestants were were torturing and killing these Anabaptists, the radicals, and and included our like last love letters, eyewitness accounts, but even also interrogation transcripts. And you see these, uh, for example, a Catholic interrogator um, accusing the Anabaptists or the radicals of of being demon possessed because they had memorized so much scripture, and so they would they would just berate them and they would use profanity on them. And they're even bleeping out this ancient document for the things some of the Catholic priests especially would say to them. And then these guys would respond with, with uh, like chapters of scripture. And so uh, they were radical in, in both senses that they had gone far beyond what people would expect and willing to die for their faith, but also they were rooting their theology in in the New Testament, and particularly in the words of Jesus, those red letters, and and really made the Sermon on the Mount there, it was sort of the constitution of the kingdom of God. So they believed that we were not only me meant to believe things about Jesus, but they were to that were to believe Jesus when he said, "Do this." <laughs> um, 
it, here's the, the wise man or wise woman who builds their house on a rock. The one who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. And then he says, so here's what you're going to do. Take up your cross and follow me, which just absolutely doesn't sound inviting at all. Um, and, and what whatever that means. Well, we're going to discover that it means the imitation of Christ through the power, empowering grace of the Spirit. That grace is not about exempting us from the Jesus way. It, it is what calls us and empowers us for it. So the first thing I want to do, let's use the share screen for a moment. <clears throat> we're back to here. And now, if I can get there, come on. The Jesus way, seven facets. And the first one we want to explore for a few minutes together is this idea of radical self-giving. Radical self-giving. This is when, when Christ, and we could even say God in his infinite love, donates himself to the world through the gift of his son. And... Um, we're going to use, there's a trigger word here for some privilege. We're going to see how Jesus idea of self-giving love uh, is, has something to do with him, Christ setting aside divine privilege without setting aside deity. And he, he forever remains fully God, but he surprises us with what fully God actually looks like. Absolute shocker. You see um, fully God to, those prior to Christ, um, if you were a Greek or a Roman, you would imagine Jupiter or Zeus. That's what God is like, ultra powerful, uh, probably violent, <laughs> definitely fickle, someone you had to try to manipulate or uh, to appease their anger and so on. But this was also a sort of a conception many of the Jews still had. The, that Yahweh was virtually the Jewish version of Jupiter. And, and again, um, easy enough to proof text. I was reading the first verses of, of Nahum chapter one today, and it's, it's like describing himself as like, I am fury and I am like violent and vengeance. And, and then it's almost like, it's almost as if he says, just kidding. Cause then the next lines are ungracious and compassionate and slow to anger. It's like, what? Well, so Jews had conceptions of God that needed clarity through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And, and um, one of the most beautiful hymns in the Bible, I don't know that Paul wrote it. Paul may be citing a hymn familiar to them, or maybe he composed it, but it's, it's a hymn that he wrote to the Philippians in chapter two. Very familiar to you, but well worth reading. And here's where we, I want you to listen for self-giving. This is, this is the way of Jesus. Christ, though in God's form, did not regard his equality with God as something he ought to exploit. Instead, he emptied himself and received the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of humans. And then, having human appearance, he humbled himself and became obedient even to death, Yes, even the death of the cross. And so God has greatly exalted him, and to him in his favor has given the name, which is over all names, that now at the name of Jesus, every knee within heaven shall bow on earth too and under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The key word in there, there's a Greek word that is become so common Um uh, you may not have heard it, but probably have. Kenosis. The question is, what does kenosis mean? Well, in some translations, this one, for example, from N.T. Wright, is he emptied himself. The question is, what did he empty? And so we've often thought about him emptying a five-gallon pail of water. And so it's like his humanity is the pail and his deity is the water. And he's poured out his deity as if he's less God now. And that's just completely wrong. What did he pour out? Himself. <laughs> it's not like he took part of himself, part of his godness and set it aside. It's, it's that in giving himself, he sets aside the, the privileges of his glory, but then 
shockingly, he reveals the glory of God on the cross. That's the weird thing. We thought like, if, if, if Jesus is like, is he just hiding his glory underneath his humanity? No, in his humanity, he's unveiling the glory of God as self-giving love. And so at the end of the gospel of John, he, he just, he says of the cross, now father glorify your son. Now the glory is going to be revealed. Now I'm going to be lifted up. And he does a pun on like ascending to glory, but also being lifted up physically onto a cross so that the throne of glory turns out to be a cross. The judgment seat of Christ is the cross. The throne of grace is the cross. And ironically, we've never seen God so clearly. God, the self-giver. Well, one thing I love to do with that, um, I mean, you could see his progression. So on the one hand, as God, he has privilege. And then, but he never exploits it for selfishness. So then he goes from having privilege to using privilege, which would which um, he does in terms of, of healing the sick and freeing those who are in bondage. He uses his privilege to make space for uh, broken women, uh, for needy people, for the poor. So now he's, he's not exploiting privilege for selfishness. He's using privilege to, to give himself to others. But, and then he actually lays down that privilege and becomes powerless so much so that he is tacked to a cross with nails in a way that at some level he can't get off there. He, he empties himself of every kind of autonomy and even is, it gives himself over to our abuse and to our murder. But in giving himself over completely, he also gives himself over to the Father's glory who raises him from the dead. Um, one, one thing I love to do with this is I will compare that Philippians to him with, um, Jesus foot washing. And the more I read the gospel of John, the more I realize everything Jesus does, every act is symbolic. Um, he turns water to wine. It's a symbol of going from old covenant to new covenant from law to spirit. Um, he goes to the woman at the well, and he's at a well, and it symbolizes the living water that he's going to give her, that she'll never be thirsty again. Um, he talks about being born again, and Nicodemus stumbles over the literalism, perhaps, and Jesus is like, no, I'm talking about more than that. Or he heals the blind man, and then he says, this is about seeing spiritually. Um, he uh, he heals he heals the guy at the pool of bethesda and it's like this is this is well i'm the living water uh he multiplies the loaves and fishes and says i'm the manna that came down from heaven so when we get to the foot washing what is he showing us and if you read it carefully step by step he's doing this he, it, it's a it's a mime of of his incarnation and i'm going to just read the the text to you with commentary so this is from um, Gospel of John again. It's only in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. And he says in verse 3, first of all, Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands. So we see Abba granting his son all authority. And then the next line says, so he got up from the supper table. And here is a picture of the son arising from his seat at the father's right hand in glory. He took off his clothes. Ah, he's setting aside that privilege of his deity and emptying himself. He wraps a towel around himself. This is God, the word, assuming a human nature, revealing the humility of true divinity. And he not only wraps the towel of humanity around himself, he wraps a towel of service and he wraps a towel of suffering. 
And then he pours out water into a bowl. And this is a picture of the divine word pouring out the living water, the spring of his life into the world. And then even pouring out the blood and water coming from his side on the cross. It's what's being poured out there. Salvation's being poured out of his suffering. And then it says, and he began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel he was wrapped in. So he washes us clean from the stains of sin and the ashes of sorrow and, and, uh, and the dust of death. He's cleansing us. This, I hear, is more than just forgiving. You know, he's cleansing us and freeing us of, of the stain that we pick up in this world. So it would be like this. If you're a meth addict, it's all very wonderful if Jesus forgives you for your addiction. <laughs> but we want to be freed from our addiction. I want to be freed from uh, from sin. And so this is where it's not just forgiveness, but it's a cleansing of, of that wedding gown. And then it says, and he put on his clothes. And so as he ascends to the cross, he is crowned, he's enthroned, and he's glorified and revealed as son of God there. <laughs> um and then it says, and he sat down again, at, where? At the Father's right hand. And, he, and that's where he rules from as what we call in the Orthodox Church, the Pantocrator, the, uh, which just means the ruler of all, which is the Greek term from Revelation 1, where Jesus Christ himself is called Almighty. But it's Almighty love revealed through radical self-giving. Now, the, the thing about this is, when Paul writes the hymn or cites the hymn, and when Jesus does this prophetic act of washing the feet in both contexts, what they say is, do this, be like Jesus, follow this example, have this mind in you that was in Christ Jesus, put others' um, uh, needs ahead of your own practice radical self-giving. And some of us, um, you know, I know that there's those of us who have done that to a fault, maybe, and it more, it's more like we're codependent. <laughs> well, that's that's not what he means. But, but we do see um, there was a time when even in general culture that we recognize selfishness as bad, a, ver a vice, and we recognize selflessness as a virtue and even saintly. And uh, that has come into, it, it, it's, it's been mocked in our age. Um, we've exalted those who are self-centered. And we've pitied those and even criticized those who've exercised self-giving. But sometimes someone comes along and they inspire us again. And you can think about those in your life who who you would regard as selfless. And you can think about those who are self-centered. Well, if the measure is who's getting ahead, I don't know. If the measure is who would you like to be like? Who would you like to have as your best friend or parent or whatever, right? And to say, well, this, this is what the father is like. Um, there's even this strange idea uh in 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 um isaiah 42 it's like i'm the lord and i will not share my glory with another that sounds like he's an egocentric kind of narcissist in context what he's he's talking to his servant and he's saying i won't share my 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 glory with another i'm going to share it with you and that's is fulfilled in christ perfectly but it's fulfilled in us too and it is the intrinsic glory of Christ-like selflessness. Um, and, and you can just see this in people like, even in, the, in, in what we think of as secular jobs, you can see it in a glorious way. Like when I think about the first responders who rushed into the Twin Towers instead of away from them on 9-11. I'm just like, my goodness. Or I, I look at how my wife poured out her all of her energy in giving birth to our boys and went through excruciating pain. And it's just like, it, it was glorious. It was Christ-like. It's self-giving love. And uh, so we do see real examples of, of kenosis in our world. Uh, second, 
we we don't you know we've got seven of these so we're going to move along and fairly quickly radical hospitality um space for all and here i'm thinking about about the space we make at our table oh did i did i hit here we go share screen radical hospitality space for all now the kingdom of God is like a banqueting table. We could even say that the church is meant to be a table. It's meant to be an open table with chairs for everyone. There are not to be the 1% or the 10% sitting on top of the kingdom table, eating everything. There's not to be the 90% under the table, hoping for scraps. The kingdom of God table is open to all and it's it's uh, it's remarkable that we see a lot more teaching from Jesus at banquet tables than we do in synagogues. And in fact, even at the banquet tables, a lot of his parables are about banquets. And it's it's this idea that the grace of God is a radical hospitality in which he he welcomes um people we would never welcome. And right away, even in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, hey, um, when, you, when you host a banquet, don't just invite people you like. Anyone could do that. Sinners do that. The mafia does that. But invite those who are normally excluded from the table. And he doesn't make a spiritual point about it, although there is one. It's the, the radical grace of God, but he's saying, be like this. And then he proceeds to be like that. And this is, this is the amazing thing, who he eats with. And so who he eats with, on the one hand, offends the religious folks who would have no doubt been judging him as they sit there remembering Psalm 1, that godly people don't eat with these kind of people. But then, you know, in retrospect, now we look at those and we think, oh, those rotten Pharisees, you know, didn't they know he eats with sinners? And and it's like, but you know what? He ate with the Pharisees too. He's at their house. And so I want you to think about um, who is it that you might despise that's either too sinful or too religious for you? Do they have a place at the table? And how can we make that space for all of them? It's And it's, it's not so easy. Um, I think about how I just, I'm so reactive in that way that, you know, um, for, for a time, it's like, I just, I just don't want to eat with fundamentalists anymore. It's, it's a pain. It's painful and I don't like it. And they, they, and then, and then, like I said this morning, I had some bad taste in my mouth from some of uh, the progressive crowd too. It's like, oh, they're all woke now. Do I really want to eat with that? And I just always have someone I don't want at my table. Well, let's contrast that to someone like St. John Chrysostom, about 400 AD. He preached in Antioch and he was quite obsessive about this hospitality business. Um, he said that you don't have a Christian family if you don't have a spare bed in your house for the stranger, a spare loaf of bread and a candle for him. So it's, and, and here's a weird thing. Sometimes I read his stuff and he sounds a bit anti-Semitic, but here's why. Because many or most of the Christians in his congregation had been Jew, Jewish converts to Jesus. And they started getting annoyed with his hospitality message. And they decided to go back to Judaism. Why? Because it was more convenient to be an insular family. And he's like, you're not a family at all. If you're an insular family. And like, oh, like pretty heavy duty, you know. And um, I mostly, I listen to that. And I just have to say, Lord, have mercy. Because I don't measure up. But it's not about me. It's about Jesus saying, here's the Jesus way. Um, but, and this especially counted for like the poor. So, uh, Chrysostom was a good friend with Basil the Great. And Basil said the same kind of stuff. Like, if you can't find Jesus in the poor, you won't find him in the chalice. So it's like, um, and he's talking about communion. And it's it's like, 
we need to learn to recognize Jesus in the least of these and welcome them. And then Basil was a monk, but he didn't just have an insular monastery. His monastery became the hub for a city that they named after him called the Basiliad, which was a city of hostels for strangers and wanderers, hospitals for the sick and infirmed, and hospices for the dying. The whole thing was a hospitality city. Well, this is what you know, we refer to when we say Jesus is the good Samaritan who brings people to our care. So we see this kind of radical hospitality. And um, one of the things I notice in one of his parables is a growing escalation of compulsion. And what he means is this. First of all, he sends out invitations um, and to the banquet of God and the people who are like too busy. Hey, I just bought a BMW. I got to go check it out. It's like, wait, you didn't, you mean you bought it before you checked it out? I call BS. <laughs> it's like, well, I just married, I just married my wife. And it's like, hello, it's a plus one. And they're, they're just all turn out to be excuses. Right. And so he says, first there's an invitation. He goes, there's still seats left. Now go out and invite more people. And so the, the invitation is going from like says, bringing invitation to, to calling them. You need to come to this. And then finally, he actually says, go out behind the hedges and to the street corners. And you know what kind of people sleep behind hedges and work on street corners. And he says of them, drag them in, compel them. It's like a fishing net. And I'm like, well, he that doesn't sound right. Why is he using coercion? It's like, he's not using coercion. He's using compulsion. What's the difference? Well, here's what I'm imagining. The kind of people he wants to come don't think they belong. I shouldn't be there. I don't measure up. That's not a place for me. And it's like, convince them. <laughs> and I think that's just like really a kind of a beautiful way to see it. Uh, the Greek word is anenkezo. I'll just pat, type it here for you, but it doesn't really matter. And I'm even pronouncing it wrong, certainly. Uh, but that's like compel. Compel them to come in and, and uh, bring them. I, I remember like, what do you mean bring them? And it's like, well, the kind of people that showed up when we had Fresh Wind Church, they needed to be brought people with disabilities who had to be brought in wheelchairs in a handy dart. Uh, people, people who lived across town and were homeless and couldn't walk across the city, needed a ride. Um, children whose parents weren't interested. Remember the big bus ministries they used to have? And uh, that was about bringing them. So we invite them, we bring them, we drag them. And it's because this hospitality uh, Jesus is so insistent on, and and really, it's um, it's like the prodigal son story too, you know, where um, where the son the son comes home, and the son the son is welcome um, uh, as he is, and there's an interesting part of that parable where he says. When the father runs to him, and it, I think it's the phrase is something weird like this, and and he, like he fell on his neck and kissed him, or something like that. And what it is, it's the same phrase used back in the story of Esau when Esau is reconciled with Jacob after being estranged, and he's so worried that they're going to have a battle, and he's so worried, and and there's a lot of paranoia between the two brothers. What's going to happen? And and here it is. The two brothers are reconciled in a way that the older and younger brothers in the prodigal son story are still waiting for. Well, Jesus leaves the older brother hanging because the older brother is me whenever I hesitate about someone being at my table. Um, here's a confession, but here's also my solution. Um, my confession is that as an ex-evangelical, I could be pretty hard on ex-evangelicals. It's ex-smoker syndrome, isn't it? Um, and judgmental of, of my people, probably because I had unresolved shame about my own story. And, and I, I'm like, 
I'd rather have supper with a Muslim in a, than an evangelical, frankly. You know, like that's what was going on in my heart. And uh, the Lord confronted me and he said, uh, my dad, Lloyd, uh, he's a quintessential essential evangelical. Um, he's obsessive about evangelism. He can't go get a haircut without trying to evangelize the barber. And, and it drives my mom nuts and it's kind of cringy. And, and on top of that, he's pretty rickety. Like he's, a, he's a, in his eighties now and he's had a heart valve replacement and he's had both his knees replaced and he's really like really old and sore and tired. And, and then he does crazy things. He'll go out with his baritone to town squares and play amazing grace in the town square. And my mom's like, why are you drawing attention to yourself? And he's like, I've got to share God's amazing grace. And it's just like, Oh dad. And, um, and then the Lord says, um, um, would the world be a better place if I took your dad, just removed him? I'm like, no. It's like, but you don't love your dad. It's like, yes, I do. And so the Lord's playing on my love for my dad as he is. And then, and, and then he says, that, that's Lloyd Evangelical. Yes, the evangelical church did a botch job, and they're very cringy these days. And they stick their foot in their mouth and, and, and shall we hate them or love them? Will the world be better if the Lord just wipes out all the evangelicals? Like, no, eh, they have to even have a place at the table because for me now, you know, the younger, I used to be young, the young activist who like reaches out to the prodigals and to the addicts and to the, the, the street workers and to the, you know what? That's sexy. There's nothing sexy about making friends with an evangelical. <laughs> so um, you might want to do an attitude check on that, especially those of you in deconstruction, just to see if bitterness about your past, because that's sure to be part of it, <laughs> is actually uh, unhealed shame about your own story. And the Lord wants you to come to peace that that was part of your story. And now I can say it this way. My dad taught me to love the scriptures and my mom taught me to love prayer. And I loved Jesus from the very first time I heard his name from their lips. And it was an evangelical fundamentalist Baptist, Baptist church that baptized me. And I remember the day with joy, you know, I'm like, oh yeah. So what happened was when my shame about being an ex-evangelical started to lift, I could start to really enjoy those parts of the story. So um, could our radical, even uh, our, our radical hospitality even be for the church? <laughs> Who knew? Um, so, I've done two. Um, I think we'll pause once in a while just to check in. Anybody have a question or a comment on either radical self-giving or radical hospitality before we move forward? You can slip your questions into the Q&A. That would help. But uh... Yeah, better than the chat. No problem. We can just carry on. We'll do one or two All more right. and see what they, happens. They may appear soon. They may be typing one finger at a time. So. Oh, yeah, that's true. And then when I see them, when I see them, I'll, I'll grab them. But the next thing we are going to do is um, radical unity. He broke the wall. <laughs> All right. <coughs> radical unity. But let's, before we do that, how would you apply radical <laughs> hospitality What to what has been critiqued as colonial mission? Boy, that's, uh, I, I think about that a lot, because here's the thing. I know that colonialism was an effort at exploiting other countries and imposing our religion on others. And so there is, you can easily get all of the horror stories about how we crushed cultures, how we raped their uh, resources and often enslaved and abused their people and then just killed them with diseases by accident on top of it. And so it's very easy and frankly sexy now to condemn colonialism and super, yeah, like, like the, both the anecdotal evidence and, and the kind of um, 
um, ac- real stats on that are pretty ugly. Uh, that said, so here's a here's something to think about. I like to be controversial sometimes, so I um, or provocative. Let's put it that way. By by thinking about the other side without just doing both sidesism, both sidesism doesn't help us. However, we what we can do is say let's make no excuses for the abuses of colonial mission. Period. And now let's add some more truth to it. Um, one, the 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 new covenant is meant to be shared across the globe. And it's good news. So I don't know what we were doing that was was terrible news, but if it wasn't the good news, then we weren't doing what Jesus called us to. But it's virtually the um, a colonial metaphor in the Bible that the glory of the Lord is meant to to cross, to cover sea to sea and fill the islands with what? With good news. Well, that's a lot different than the kind of forced conversions we did, but there were those who went out with good news. And what was the good news? You don't have to kill your children anymore for these idols. Everywhere Christianity went, a lot of bad stuff followed with it. (laughs) But also, Everywhere Christianity goes, child sacrifice ends. Sacrificial systems end. The kind of sacrificial systems that rely on on manipulating fickle and evil gods. And so I remember going to Haiti and the Mennonites are super careful about not doing colonial mission. They're like, we are not here to convert them. We're just here as relief and development workers to help them get on their own. And I, my question was, yeah, but they're terrified. They're living in tin shacks, suffocating at night with their children, and they won't open a window because they think a boogeyman's going to come steal the children at night. And then the Mennonites put together like farming cooperatives where the, the people's crops start growing better, but when their crops start growing better, the people entrapped in voodoo think it's because their their spirits have come and stolen the fertility from their land. So they go burn the bin, the granary, and destroy all the grain from the village. (laughs) Like, people, you know? So um, I'm like, do we have good news for them? Or we just let them continue in fear, you know? And so I think think this kind of, um, uh, Simone Weil put it this way. She said, I would not give one dime to Christian missionary endeavors in other nations. But then on the other hand, she's like, Jesus didn't go come to start a religion. He came to share good news. And we could do that. We just need to sort out what the good news is. How about things like this? You don't need to be afraid anymore. Death, the power of death has been broken and you don't have to worship death anymore. Um, these idols actually are nothing. They've been defeated by Jesus, who's Lord, and he wants nothing but you from you, but the debt of love for his love. That, and then we tell them about how much, you know. So if we could do that right, maybe, maybe colonial mission would, um, maybe we could package all the ugly stuff into that phrase and then just replace it with, we, we are bringers of good news. Um. How might the practice, you practice radical hospitality when fear or disagreement makes you feel out of place somewhere? I often feel like I'm trespassing when I step into most churches, usually in spite of the hospitable welcome the congregation tries to show me. Hmm. I wonder if, I wonder if Jesus fit in well. (laughs) He doesn't, you know, um, I suppose the trick there is to know who you are and to learn who you are from Jesus and then to ask him where he wants you to send to send you and then begin to see Jesus in the other. It's easy to see difference. That's easy, you know, but when I can begin to see Jesus in them and and one marvelous fruit of that we're going to talk about in the, in the next section. So 
in fact, let's go there now. I suppose the 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 pat answer is love, but maybe it's actually the the real answer. True. So radical unity. Oops. Share screen. Now I have to make a confession. Uh, when I the first draft of that chapter uh, was incredibly discouraging to write. I don't have much good news about radical unity. That's what I was thinking. Really. I thought my only strategy for this chapter can be lament because the reality is that Jesus said in his high priestly prayer that he, his express will is that we would be one as he and his father are one. And so much of what we do, even down to writing doctrinal statements to try to be faithful is an act of deliberate defiance in terms of that command that the express will of Jesus that we would live that we would be brothers and sisters and so we find a million ways to split and then we call that faithfulness in the early church schism that's having a split schism was the first heresy even arianism that denied jesus was fully god say like in the same way jehovah's witnesses do they didn't kick them out. Faithfulness was debating them rigorously for like more than a hundred years. But it was considered in-house because you don't split. And in fact, that's what the first heretics did. The first heretics were the ones who said, my way or the highway, we are out of here. We're going to go start our own thing. That That's what the heretics did. Um, what the church did was said, no, we're a family and we have to work this out and it's going to be messy, but, but, but Jesus said we're one. So we're going to be one, you know? And so, um, so I was just lamenting this as I'm, I'm writing the book and I'm thinking about the history of the church. And, uh, and so about a 1000 AD, you have East and West, the Latin and the Greek East and West split. And then, and then you get to the Protestant Reformation and Luther nails his 95 thesis to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. From that day in 1517, on average, we have two new denominations form every week. Depends how you count them, but probably the best way of counting them brings us to 33,000 denominations. That's not just churches, that's whole denominations. A few of those are were new for other reasons like immigration waves and stuff like that, but a lot of it it's just like I'm faithful and you're not and I'm out of here. And so it became this epidemic of of schism that so so that's what I'm thinking when I write this. And then a really wild thing happened. Um I happened to be in New Brunswick at the time, and we had that horrendous uh, massacre of Muslims in their mosque in New Zealand while I was there. And, um, you know, it's a little bit like those Anabaptists. The blood of the martyrs caused a revival. People are like, these people who are dying are dying um, uh in peace and they're not afraid whatever that is i don't have it and i want it so there was a rapid growth of, of anabaptist churches in in that era what well, was the bit like that with this is um when the when the, when that massacre happened the reaction could have been just enormous global war between uh christians and muslims and and, and jews um all by the way children of Abraham, who all intend to pray to the God of Abraham, even though they conceive of him in somewhat different ways. But what happened on this case was the opposite. We suddenly had groups of Christians like surrounding mosques to protect them while they prayed, like three deep all the way around in cities around the world. And then we discovered that there were that there were Muslims in New York City surrounding the synagogues that had been vandalized. 
and then we discovered that there's you know um, uh, Jews writing to like these rabbis writing to the Muslim imams in solidarity and love and and I realized oh my goodness the the blood of these people is the foundation of a new unity if we want it but it and it, I mean the this rocked the world. And so um, I want to give you an example from the book. Um, this is how I became very good friends with, with um, uh, Safi Kaskas. He's an elderly man, a, skull, a Quranic scholar, a Muslim, who says you cannot be a good Muslim without following Jesus. And, and here's what he wrote after the, after the massacre of his fellow Muslims. He wrote this open letter to Muslims, quoting the Quran, even if you try to kill me, I will not try to kill you. I fear God, the Lord of all the worlds. The proper response to attacks on Islam and Muslims should begin with the following. One, to respond for the sake of God and seeking his approval, not for the sake of revenge. Two, to respond with the intention to guide others to the ways of goodness, mercy, and love. Too often, some Muslims respond to hateful attacks with more hatred, which only continues the cycle of vengeance. Rather, we must intend by our responses to guide and benefit the very people who launched the attacks in the first place. Do you know where he got that from? The Sermon on the Mount. He reads the Sermon on the Mount like, and does commentary on it because he says, we need to know what Jesus said and obey him. That's what a good Muslim does. Meanwhile, I said, some of my Christian friends are saying, I'm quoting the same verses as him and they're calling me dangerously naive. He's saying, no, to be a Muslim is to follow Jesus into the kingdom of God. It's like, what? Muslims don't believe that. He says they, they're supposed to. It's like, well, we don't, Christians never hear that. He's like, why would we tell you that? You just use it as ammo. <laughs> he carries on. Eternity with God is not here on earth, but in the hereafter. Here's the, he is the ultimate judge of our, of our deeds. And his 75th birthday was about a week after the attack. And he posted his resolution for his 75th birthday. A new year of my life is just starting a resolve to live in a meaningful way. I will trust God and allow him to lead. I will keep my mind open for new ideas. I will be a teacher, learner. I will serve humbly. I will not judge others. I will forgive freely. I will work for peace and try to be a, a, a bridge builder. You know what Jesus said? Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. And probably, probably whether you call yourself a Muslim or a Christian means very, very little. It's, are you actually a peacemaker? And so I've been thinking about that. Uh, the Christianity has become a real object of hatred in the world because of our misbehavior. And I think, is it really for me to say that I'm a Christian? Well, I can say I'm, I'm, I love Jesus, but wouldn't it be probably more appropriate if you ask my next door neighbor, is Brad a Christian? And so if people ask me that, I may just say, well, I don't know, ask Daryl and Christine. <laughs> they they live next door. They're they're pagans, and they get to see the real me. And they may not affirm that I'm a Christian, or maybe maybe they'll even say, "No, he's much nicer than Christians." <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it depends what they think about that. Um. So, I just thought about. I I thought my despair over unity within the church was is like, what if God's even able to do better than that? What if he's able to reconcile Muslim and Christian and Jewish brothers and sisters, at least the children of Abraham, right? And um, so I had Safi and I team taught on the Beatitudes at my wife's church. It was so fascinating. And because it was on Zoom, we had a Christian pastor from Pakistan join us. And he's like, but Safi, the Muslims here are they just slaughtered five Christian families. And Safi's like, well, that's not right because Muhammad said he made five or six different um, commitments to never, to protect Christians. And, and he, so this Christian pastor in Pakistan is like, where do I find them? He said, I'll get them for you. So here's what he did. 
Safi gathered these things, these documents. He sent them to the Christian guy in pastor in Pakistan. He said, are you able to get these to Al-Qaeda who had sponsored the attack? And the guy absolutely knew the connections. And, and so this Christian pastor delivered stuff from Safi by Muhammad about protecting Christians. And at first they balked, but then they went, they went and they, um, they did a double check on it and they came back and they, they said, you're absolutely right. Uh, we're not going to let this happen anymore. There will be no more slaughter of Christians. Now you do still get some isolated things, but not any kind of uh, Al Qaeda planned terrorism against Christians. And that was because a Pakistani Christian and a, a and a Saudi act or Lebanese Saudi Muslim got together during a Zoom meeting of a little church in Abbotsford and created a strategy. And I'm like, that's what I'm doing. Oh, this is much better now. This is Jacob and Esau. This is, this is, you know, even um, um, what's, what's Ishmael and Isaac. You know? So I, I kind of am really excited about the possibilities now of being peacemakers, finding people of peace, who are not only Muslims, but may even be Baptists and Vineyard and Catholic and charismatic and who knows what's possible, but at least it gave me some energy again for it, you know? Um, um, someone's asking about the word heresy because I've been using that. I want to say this, um, th th there's some debate about what it meant, but I'll, I'll tell you how it was used. Um, it was not used like we do today as an insult for people who disagree with us because <laughs> I'm always right. So anyone who disagrees must be a heretic. Um, it meant less than that in some ways. It meant they made a mistake. They are a Christian and they've made a mistake and we will debate their mistake because, and, 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 and we'll debate it as brothers and sisters. Um, and even vigorously, and but they realized if it turned into conflict that they were sinning. We think it's still faithfulness if it turns into conflict. The other thing about heresies back then was, um, you know, less of a pejorative, but also that it was more specific. In other words, you didn't just call anything a heresy. Primarily a heresy is a place where you were not in agreement with the Nicene Creed. So the Nicene Creed was a memory of the gospel encapsulated. And so um, heresies were usually specific to something about father, son, or spirit, usually the son, the nature of Jesus Christ. That's a, that was the heresies. So now it's just like, if you don't like the color of my car, you're a heretic, you know, <laughs> or, or all these tertiary things. So, um, and so it doesn't really become, well, what's a sect? So, so I think I think the he the heretics who who left who stomped out the door then they would form sects so that was sort of the fruit of it in my my estimation. All right, number four. How are we doing with time? I've covered my time up. We've got about uh, a little little better than a half hour. Good. All right, now I'm going to shift over to um, radical recovery. And this is where we take up our cross and follow Jesus. And so really, the, uh, what I do in the book is I do a summary of, of what, the, what, what the Sermon on the Mount is doing. And it's an assault on the old self. It's a, an assault on the ego. And it's about internalizing the love of God and letting go of um, self-centeredness and, and self-obsession and self-aggrandizement. So it's old self, new self, and there, there, it's a crucifixion of the demands of your ego. And so there's a, there's a way of a cross. And so um, one, I call this radical recovery because I have a, a, a friend, he, he, um, he would, if you said, are you, Ed, are you a Christian? He would say, absolutely not. In, in fact, he'd get grumpy. He's an old, old guy. But then, but then he, 
he he prays. He prays the serenity prayer every day. He prays the prayer of St. Francis every day. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. He reads the Sermon on the Mount, parts of it every day. And I'm like, but I thought you're not a Christian. He goes, well, I'm not. <laughs> I just, I believe in God and I follow Jesus. I'm like, I think that's a Christian. He goes, definitely not. <laughs> so he's so funny. But he, and so he's always texting me these beautiful little messages. He's a guy probably early 70s about recovery. And he says um, that the Sermon on the Mount is the original recovery program. Um, it's the foundation of all our recovery because in it, what the, the, um, if you, if you talk to any kind of alcoholic or addict of any, of any kind, he would say, um, these programs aren't just about ending, uh, bad behaviors and staying sober. They are about the removal by God alone of your deepest character defects, which are all rooted in self-will and that self-will is is indivisibly connected to fear that i'm not okay that i'm not okay in myself i'm not okay before god and i need to somehow survive and i'm not doing a very good job of surviving and it's making a mess of my life oh i better have a drink see that's all that's the fruit right but the sermon on the mount is going after the very roots of it and, and at the very roots of it, take up your cross includes this idea of, uh, of um, the first beatitude. So the first, I'm going to see if I can find Ron Dart's translation. Ah, yes, I found it. So Ron Dart is a mentor of mine. He was my PhD supervisor and also a, a hiking guide. And he would take me in the hills and we would talk about the Sermon on the Mount and we'd talk about Plato, and we talk about lots of lots of interesting stuff, the Beatitudes especially, though. And so this program of radical recovery begins with the Sermon on the Mount, which begins with the Beatitudes, which begins with the first Beatitude, which summarizes everything. Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so then the debate is, what, what do we mean by poor in spirit? Well, um, Dallas Willard wrote his classic, it was an instant classic, uh, The Divine Conspiracy, magnificent book. It's a keeper. You should probably have it. That said, his emphasis on the Beatitudes was sort of like this, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the those who mourn, blessed are the meek, and so on, those hungry for justice. And he treats it like the first half of each Beatitude is, is blessed are the losers, because the kingdom of God is even for losers. You're not excluded if you're the downtrodden and marginalized. And I like that. Um, but I think there's like way more going on there. And that is that the first half of each beatitude describes um, Christ and, and his humility and his self-giving love that he is poor in spirit, not because he's a down and outer, but because he's emptied himself of ego. He mourns, not because he's just this glum kooken sad guy. <laughs> he carries all the grief and sorrow of the world in his heart and on his shoulders to the cross. Um, he is meek, not because he's weak, but he is power under control for the purpose of goodness. And it's marked by humility. He is hungry and thirsty for justice and righteousness. And he proclaims it as a prophet to this world and then embodies it himself. Blessed are the merciful. Jesus is the all merciful one. I mean, even the Muslims got that one, right? Their opening prayer is of, of five times a day um, in the name of God, the merciful God, the all merciful God, the especially merciful. Well, that's fulfilled in Jesus. Um, blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Well, no one's seen God except God, God, the son who's in the bosom of the father. He's seen God and he's made him known to us through himself. Um, blessed are the peacemakers. They should be called children of God. And the insult is that we plagiarized a word Jesus coined and we made it a brand name for handguns and missiles. Come on, that's blasphemy. But we do know who the peacemaker is. And he has made peace with God. He's made peace with this world. He's made peace with this earth. 
he's made peace in ourselves. And so he, um, he's the one breaking these dividing walls that, that renew radical unity. And so what we see, and Pope Benedict said this, that, that the first half of each beatitude is like the crucifixion of Jesus. And the second half of each beatitude, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, they shall be comforted. Uh, they will inherit the land. They will be filled and so on. That's the resurrection of Jesus. So the, the, um, the, the, the beatitudes are a veiled biography of Jesus, but his character, but also then he says, uh, the Pope, he said, they are transposed into the daily, the life of daily discipleship of a believer. What does it mean to be crucified with Christ? Nevertheless, I live on a daily basis. What does it mean to take up your cross and follow him? Oh, it means that I embody the Beatitudes. You embody the Beatitudes. And so what I've done is I've memorized the Beatitudes and I try to pray them every day. And what I, the side benefit I wasn't expecting was they also operate as a powerful furnace for discernment. And I think I did share this when I was last with you, that if you will install the Beatitudes in your heart and pray them daily, you know what will happen? You will never be deceived by a false prophet again. Okay, that's a strong statement. But I'll tell you what, when someone comes to you with a grandiose prophecy trying to flatter your flesh, it won't get past poor in spirit. It won't get past mourning and meekness. <laughs> and you'll just go, oh, you're just trying to flatter me. I don't need that kind of prophecy. Encouragement, yes. But grandiosity is the number two cause of relapse after resentment. So um, I'm going to read Ron's translation of it. But I saw somebody put their hand up. Does that mean that there is an qu outstanding question? You know, I I don't know. Um, if so, whoever put their hand up, go ahead and type it into the Q and A, and we'll pick up on it. But here's what Ron says, and so blessed isn't just like happy. Blessed, the word makarios is more like um, uh, the divine life. <laughs> it's not just how lucky are you, and so Ron translates it that way. We thought the divine life looked like the Greek gods or something. No, the divine life looks like the humility of Jesus of Nazareth. And so the divine life, here is his translation. The divine life is for those who die to the demands of the ego. Such people will inhabit the kingdom of heaven. The divine life is for those who've lived through tragedy and suffering. Such people will be comforted at a deep level. The divine life is for those who bring their passions under control for goodness. It is such people that will inherit the earth. The divine life is for those who hunger and thirst for justice. Such people will be fed to the full. The divine life is offered to those who are gracious and merciful. Such people will be treated in a merciful and gracious manner. The divine life is offered to those whose home is clean on the inside. Such people will know the very presence of God and see his face. The divine life is offered to those who are makers and creators of peace. Such people will be called the children of God. The divine life is known by those who are persecuted, seeking justice. See, justice and righteousness are the same word in Greek and Hebrew and Czech and Chinese and every language except English. We separated righteousness and justice. Such people will know what it means to live in the kingdom of heaven. The divine life is known by those who are mistreated and misunderstood in their passion for justice. They will inherit the kingdom of heaven. The prophets were treated this way in the past. And so, so it's really, it's really um, boils down to what I see, like in the, it's very similar to first three steps of 12 step that I've mentioned before, you know, step one is, is, uh, is we admitted that we were powerless over our addictions and that our lives had become unmanageable. We were, we had, we bottomed out and, and recognized poverty of spirit. We bankrupted. Sometimes our addiction actually is what bankrupted our ego for us. Thank God. Step two, we came to believe that there's a power greater than ourselves that could restore us to sanity. 
and that self-will wasn't going to do it. Self-will got us in the problem in the first place. Kenosis is what does it. And so step three, we made a decision to surrender or, or, or to uh, hand over our will and our lives to the care of this loving God. So, so surrender, letting go, um, which is literally what we mean by for, the word, the Greek word for forgive is like loosing, letting go. Um, it's weird because it's this, the same word for forgive as it is for divorce. Did you know that? It's the same word. Why? Well, because it's about loosing, letting go. And, um, and so maybe there's some stuff in me I need to divorce. I need to let go of. I need to surrender. And that can be, I need to surrender people to the Lord. I need to surrender um, harmful behaviors to the Lord. I need to, see, to surrender my regrets and my self-loathing to the Lord. I need to surrender my anxiety and, and all the cares. Of, well, whatever. Surrender, 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 surrender. So we, we go to the cross. And we surrender at the cross and then we take up the cross, which is back to the self-giving that we become like him in this world. Mm -hmm. um, so that brings us to the end of uh, the fourth facet. Number five, radical peacemaking, radical forgiveness, confessions of a violent SOB. That's me. Um, so, I mentioned this yesterday that it, sometimes I've been accused of, of, you know, that there's a naivety in my peacemaking when in reality it is about repentance for me um, because I, I was, as a child, I was bullied and I was fearful and I began to cope with that by fighting back and I didn't get very good at it, but I got good enough at it that half the time I was bullied and half the time I became the bully. There was, <laughs> someone's going to lose and get hurt. It's a zero sum game when we go to violence and retribution as a way to somehow even things out and make justice in this world. It doesn't work that way. It really doesn't work that way. And so um, uh, I, I want to, there's a bit of my history I wanted to share. I think I'll just tell you about a, a conversion I had. And that was I when I first went to Bethel Mennonite, my wife's church, their peace, a peace church, and I was not a peace guy. And I was kind of a, a jerk about it. And they would try to argue me into a peacemaking position using the Bible and using their Mennonite history and using logic and what it, blah, blah. it just didn't work on me. I had layers and layers of defense for the violent impulses inside of me that were rooting, rooted in this bullying. And, and then um, one day a weird thing happened. I was watching Apocalypse Now for the third time. <laughs> and, you know, famous war movie starting Martin Sheen. And there's this, there's this scene in it where they're going, they're in a gunboat and they run into a Vietnamese fishing boat with a family in it. And it's none of their business to stop these guys, but they go over and stop them anyway. And then they get all paranoid and, and ed, things escalate. And then they see movement in a basket, which freaks them out and they slaughter everybody in the fishing boat. And they open the basket. It was just a puppy. And and something clicked in my head. I had already seen the movie twice, but something clicked in my head. And I'm like, this is evil. And this is not fiction. This happens all the time. Much worse than this. Because there's also the rape impulse that accompanies uh, these kind of raids. It's historically just a fact. And, and the guys that come back with PTSD is largely not things that happened to them in the war. It's things they saw and did that they, you know, when they, when they return home. And so when I see support our troops, I think we better because uh, we sent them and we better take care of them when they get back. But what we usually meant by support our troops was support our military foreign policy and just keep sending them. And, and uh, so what I've tried to do is in terms of supporting troops is in, because I'm, I don't like militarism. I realize I could dehumanize soldiers. So I make sure I'm good friends with some soldiers and I support them by asking them 
not politicians, asking them, oh, you've done five tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. What's it like there? What do you want us to know? And then they say things like, it's wicked and we shouldn't be there. It's like, support your troops then, <laughs> you know? So um, um, anyway, so, so somehow that scene, it was a gestalt shift. It's like, I didn't walk my way to a different position. It's just, there was something flipped and I went, there's no good guys in killing. The same month, a little old lady had heard me justifying, of all things, I'm justifying a militarism from a Mennonite pulpit. Give your melon a shake, Brad. That was a losing battle. <laughs> and this little old lady, an old German woman, such a quiet, lovely, sweet woman, but she comes up to me and, and I've never seen, I never saw her angry before or after. And that morning she said to me, I was a girl in Germany when allies dropped bombs on our village three days after we surrendered. Don't tell me there's good guys. And I'm like, what? That's real? <laughs> How are you going to fact check that? We're, we, that's not going to be in our history books. We hide that stuff. And I'm like, I guess I have, I either believe her or I don't. But it was weird that in the same month, this uh, war does something destructive in our own souls, right? And so I, I'm thinking, well, how can we be, how can we be into radical peacemaking and radical forgiveness? Not just like I've, I've, I've belly ached enough about militarism. How about me? How am I going to stop being violent in my heart? How will I get these external things? What good is it if I'm a peace activist, if I'm hateful in my heart? And guess what? I see them all the time. Red eyed, angry peace activists. So at IRPJ, that's the Institute of Religion, Peace and Justice, our primary, and it's connected to SSU, our primary, the, the, the fundamental, the foundation of the whole peacemaking process is the inner transformation of a peacemaker. I have, I have to get into here to the roots of my where I'm carrying resentment. And um, this is this is actually very much connected to the next one. So I'm just going to go straight to it. I love this Fred Rogers quote someone put in the chat. When I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. That's it. Because it's not just about opposing violence and war. It's about peacemaking is about building um, a social kind of a, a, a social atmosphere where the kind of people who get desperate enough to be terrorists have no reason to become desperate. You, you don't strap bombs to a child if you can, if you have schools and hospitals and clean water for them, you don't need to. Right. So um, there's, a, there's a question there, Brad. Uh, Mary asked, what would you say about Jesus' statement that he has not come to bring peace, but a sword? Yeah. So clearly, clearly when he said, love your enemy, pray for your enemy, and bless your enemy, he doesn't mean hit them with a sword. In fact, he says to Peter, put down your sword. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. And the early Christians for 300 years took that as a command to all Christians. You had, to, you had to lay down that kind of stuff. But in the context where he's saying that, he's being a realist. And he's saying, look, it, if you if you are in a, a family and you take up your cross to follow me and your brother won't, it will create division in the family. And that's what he says. It's... Um, in the following verse, he's, he's just like, there, there is going to, it's inevitable. Be, and especially in a culture, uh, we don't see it as much here, but you would still see this heavily in Asia, but definitely in Jesus' time, this honoring of parents to the point of uh, I, idolatry. And if your parents said, don't convert and you convert, they may kill you. You know, it's that kind of thing. And so, so he was making them aware in the broader context of, hey, if you're going to follow me, you need to, you need to really count the cost because you could lose your inheritance over this. 
you could, you, your family may divide over this. And if you're not willing to let the dead bury their dead and say goodbye to your mom and dad, then, then you probably shouldn't follow me at this point. <laughs> you know, they, he says harsh stuff like that. He is definitely not a focus on the family guy. Um, uh, cause we, he saw how, how families can create idolatrous systems and, uh, and I've run into that. All right. So connected to this forgiveness, I want to just, uh, back to, that was a great question, by the way, you guys always have such good questions. So connected to forgiveness, I want to talk about surrender again. So surrender came up both in radical recovery time. Okay. Radical recovery and in this idea of radical forgiveness. Um, but uh, I was, I just want to tell you a story and, and, and give you a prayer of surrender that I use. So my story is this, um, when my son and his, my second son and his wife were going through their divorce, it got like really ugly for a while. And we, they'd had a child and I, it, I literally, I had, I, I grieved the death of my granddaughter in this, not in the sense that I thought she died, but I would have nightmares that she had, but what was dying was my dreams of having a relationship with her. And that it looked very likely Well, in fact, the mom had said at the time, I, um, I'm cutting your family out. You are, you know, and, and you, I would never see her again. And I thought, well, maybe when she's an adult, we'll be able to find her somehow. So that's where I was so angry about that. And she, uh, and then she kind of took at, the, and I want to say at this point, we've gone through an amazing reconciliation process and her and my, my son are now good friends, co-parenting the child. And my son is super supportive. She's super supportive of him. We had a miracle happen, but to get to the miracle was, was involved carrying a cross. So she, she had at one point said some, cruel things to my wife who'd been nothing but a goddess to her really honestly. And I took offense and I could feel the anger in me, the, the seething darkness filling my whole house. And I'm like, wow, I am generating some kind of dirty energy here. And so I thought I'm going to, I, I got to get out of here. I'm, and I, I could feel myself entering a panic attack. So I got my prayer rope. Hang on. Oh, I'm going to reach over and get it if I can. <clears throat> stop share so here's a orthodox prayer rope this is a cool one it's leather and it looks like a holster right see the holster guess what's in all of those things actual bullets no little scrolls everyone has a scroll in it and on every scroll it says lord jesus christ son of god have mercy on me so I, sometimes I will use this and you just go, Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And, and it will pull me out of a panic attack so I can get my eyes back on Jesus. So I went, I thought I got to get out of those. So I just started doing this. And, and in panic attack, it's more like, Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, you know, and I'm doing this and, and freaking out. And I could feel the redness and the heat in my face. And I could, and, um, and, and I just thought, I need to do this until I can breathe enough to listen to the Lord. And I probably, I don't know, I probably did 300 or 600 prayers of that. I, I don't know. I just kept doing the rounds. And, um, and then when I finally, I finally could breathe a little bit, I hear the Lord say, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you because my yoke's easy and my burden is light. And, and, and I'm going to teach you how to have rest in your soul. And, and I'm like, well, that sounds good, but shouldn't I be dealing with my anger? And he's like, that is how you deal with your anger. I'm like, no, aren't, aren't I ignoring my anger? Don't I have to process? He goes, that's how you process it. <laughs> you come close to me and you let me hold you. And, and, and in the warmth of his embrace, then I can just breathe out those, the toxic thing I was generating in a safe way. And so, so I start doing this and I, I could kind of feel his peace come. 
And I'm like, that's interesting because I would have thought I was, I was like procrastinating dealing with my anger when in fact, he's like, let me put it this way. Are you weary? I'm like, I'm so weary. Um, and he's like, yeah, the, this, this is wearing you out and, and carrying the anger and the resentment. It's wearing you out and, it, and it's bleeding over other people. So that's Saturday. Sunday morning, I go to church and I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm still feeling the sort of the aftermath, the hangover of this experience. So I thought I'm going to go over to confession. So in confession, I go and I kneel beside Bishop Varlam, who's my, he looks like Santa Claus. And, and, and he actually takes me cheek to cheek and this big bushy white beard. And he just gently says, what's troubling you? That's how he would always start. What's troubling you? And I'm just like, I'm just so angry. And I start expressing this, this, battle with hatred towards my daughter-in-law and and he said well maybe you know of course we all get angry sometimes but can you hear these words of jesus today come to me all you are weary and heavy laden i will give you rest and he quotes the same passage i'm like that's awesome that's what i heard yesterday and he says well just get up and and, and just you know, walk with God or something, <laughs> you know, he dismisses me. So I stand up and as I stand up, I see this old Russian icon has been, is there and I've never seen it before. He goes, oh yes, this is an antique that was given to us yesterday. And it's got Jesus and, you know, and he's holding open a Bible like this and it's got words in it in old Russian, ancient Russian. And I'm like, can you translate that? And he goes, oh, he puts his glasses and he goes, oh yes. Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I'm like, like he had just said that to me 60 seconds before. And then I hear Dimitri, who's one of their chanters, and he's calling me. He wants me to go pray. Uh, they, So he hands me a prayer. I rush over there. It's like, okay, I took too long in confession. So I go over there. He gives me this thing. He goes, chant this. <laughs> and it's a prayer. And he goes, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So um, what am I getting at there? Well, I get, what, what I'm saying is that uh, um, there's so many things that weary us. And part of, the, part of the gospel, though Jesus' way, is radical surrender of absolutely everything. And I will, I know it's, it's worth just saying this before I go to the next last facet. You know, I, I'm aware of a, I have a friend who's in the hospital now. She had anorexia. I have permission to share this because she wants to help people. She went down to 61 pounds, stage four kidney failure in both in, in both kidneys, seizures because of lack of good fats to her brain. Um, uh, and then her lungs started filling up. And they were having to pound on her lungs every um you know, every few hours to try to get the phlegm out because she was drowning of pneumonia and pleurisy. And it's just like, she couldn't eat anymore. So she was on a feeding tube and she can't, she couldn't stand up. And, and she went into a fever of 105. And I mean, like, you name it, what else could go wrong? Oh, and then her husband leaves her for another woman. <laughs> just like, so I, I was saying my goodbyes. And, but what the Lord's shown her to do is she has to surrender absolutely every emotion as it comes. Absolutely every memory, absolutely every person. She cannot afford to come out of the waterfall of mercy where she feels the warmth and presence of Jesus. Because if she comes out, she can't eat that day. Well, thanks be to God, uh, she, she's now gone from 61. And today I think she weighed in at 73 and her lungs have cleared up and her fever has gone away. And she got to walk down the hallway a little bit today with a walker and she might make it. She might not. It depends on whether she surrenders. Uh, um, it hour, hour by hour surrender is not enough for her. Um, and and uh, who knows, she might make it, but she wants you to make it. And she says, here's how you do it. I surrender all is a real thing. And if you can get away without surrendering, pity to you. Uh, we, because Jesus is the best thing we have going and he, he knows we're weary and 
All right, so now we've got two minutes left to talk about facet seven. And I will stay a little bit longer if you wanna do a few more questions, but just out of this comes radical compassion and radical justice. And it's, it's like now we carry the cross into the world. And I love this. I, I can't remember who said it now. It might've been Gutierrez, but you love the poor, name them. <laughs> Compassion means calm passion, co-suffering, and it means then um, we need to really, uh, we need to think not just in terms of providing social services. We need to actually ask, do you have a name? We need to humanize people, which I think what's, is what go, is going on with the Gadarene demoniac. We took this thing of when Jesus says, what's your name? And he goes, we are legion. <laughs> We're like, see, you have to find out the demon's name to do deliverance. It's like, no, he's rehumanizing the guy. The guy's lost his, he, he's virtually living like a dog. And, and the first thing Jesus does to set him free is, is to call on his name. And so I, I've been, I've been thinking about that. Oh, did I not have that up? Okay. So we had, there it is. Facet seven, radical compassion, radical justice. So what we do is we, um, uh, we want to, we want to be kingdom people in this world who are willing to not just fix problems with our clever solutions, but yeah, be a creative minority who, who uh, is willing to, to say, I know you're hurting and I'm willing to come alongside you, but from relationship. And I know that um, uh, for uh, one example, a negative example, Portland is really known for being a city where, you know, they're, they're really into justice and compassion and tolerance and all of that. And, but a friend of mine who works down there, he, just, he says, oh, we're all about talking it, but ask the same people, you know, do you ever eat, do you have friends from the other side? <laughs> do you eat with them? It's like, oh no, it's like more of an idea than a relationship. And so I want to be like that. And and um, my friend Linda, she's uh, she's probably, oh, she's got to be 90 by now. Well, her husband is for sure. She's late 80s. He's 90. She can, she's usually um, sits on a walker once she can push it enough to get to her car. But the Lord just said to her, I want you to go to the homeless and have a ministry to them, rehydrating them and asking their names. So she goes around and she she stops by homeless people who are, they don't have enough water. So she gives them water and she asks them their name and she calls them by name and she remembers their name and she puts their name in ribbons and all these ribbons are tied to her, um, her blinker indicator thing in her car. And, um, and, and, uh, and out of that, she's been, she just sees so many tears flow. And the moment she uses their name, they're willing to let her pray for her for her to pray for them. And uh, so you, if we care, learn their name, that, that'd be a good start. Um, yeah, someone said, I bet everyone in the region just referred to him, you, you know, the guy down by the tombs, if they'd even say guy by that point, <laughs> you know, the, the monster. Well, what's your name? And I, I just think it's funny in my head because it's like, I imagine Jesus going, what's your name? We are legion. It's like, not you, the guy. Oh, I'm Bob. Hi, Bob. <laughs> so, um, Bob, we're going to set you free now. Oh, cool. Bob the demoniac. Um, so I think that's that's enough teaching. Um, before we leave tonight, I'm, I'm happy to do a few last round of questions if you'd like. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so if you've got a question, type it into the Q&A. Um, that would be super helpful if you do it that way. Um, I will say that everything that Brad's been going over with this is in his book in greater depth. Uh, and so this is this has been um, uh, super, you know, fantastic. But you can you can get the book and and all this is just like covered in, in even greater detail, and um, um, so I really encourage you to to pick that book up if you don't have it yet, and uh, and that translation that Brad read from uh, the Beatitudes or uh, from, yeah of the Beatitudes is in is in in the book, um, and uh, and you can find it there. Even my correspondences with Martin Sheen after watching the. Uh, Apocalypse Now are in the book, so enjoy. <laughs>
we had a nice exchange of letters over it. He he was quite excited because he's a he's a hardcore Jesus follower. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. I know, I know that it's been a lot of content and we're all still processing things, but we do, if, what is a good time to take advantage if, if you've got a question. So we've got one. Oh, Bill uh, is just asking, which book? A More Christ-like Way. Uh, and so we'll have that for those like Bill who are in the Raleigh area. Uh, we will have that at the church office at a discounted price. Uh, for the rest of you, you can drive to Brad's house or you can go to Amazon or whatever your favorite bookseller is. Uh, and you can order it. You know, it's um, I don't know if it's in Audible, but it's at least in Kindle. It's in paperback. Uh, I can I can say this, that the, the, the paperback version is getting five out of five star kind of ratings and the Audible is like one out of five. <laughs> And I don't know what happened. I didn't do the reading. And so what I'm hearing is that it's not recommended. And I would say you'd probably want the hard copy anyway. Another thing is this, out of principle, we're finding some people like really don't prefer to shop on Amazon. Right. Um, here's a reality though. Uh, you could ask your local bookstore to order it. Um, but although I know that, that Amazon is the great beast and the antichrist for many people, <laughs> Um, the truth for authors like like me is that the publishing world um, had us by the throat as authors, and we were getting contracts where we'd get six percent, and um, uh, and so I, you know, and the publishers and the distributors were taking all our money, and Amazon came along, and and what they did is they made a self publishing deal and distributing deal where we where authors can get like forty percent. And they do the printing, the shipping, everything for us. So, although it's the although it's the great Satan in many other regards, um, um, I wouldn't not buy books from me on Amazon because they they actually did us a great service by breaking the monopoly. So, thanks. <laughs> uh, a couple questions there, Brad, in the questions uh, Q and A, and the books also on Barnes and Noble. Yeah, okay. So this may be overly personal, so it might not be great. How do you surrender yourself and your burdens to Jesus when you can't, for lack of a better term, find him? Um, so uh, uh, summarize. He will find you, but one way I do it is this. I say, um, I close my eyes and I picture him. I don't know if you can find him, but I'm pretty sure you can picture him. And I can tell you this, if you picture him, he will inhabit the picture. If you can't picture him, get an icon and look at it and he will mm -hmm. inhabit the icon. If you have a favorite Jesus movie, use the image as like a mere, um, it's not him, but he'll inhabit it. And so I'll give you an example. I, I met an addict who had, who had, um, well, she had been a prostitute and she was living in a dumpster and then God called her out of it just miraculously, but she still for 10 years, she couldn't find him. And I'm like, what do you mean you can't find him? Just uh, close your eyes and picture him. And she's like, well, I can picture Ted Neely. Like he was the actor who did Jesus Christ Superstar. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like yeah. that'll do. So tell Ted Neely, Jesus, what you're feeling and what you want to surrender. And no, he doesn't look like Ted Neely, but he can use that picture to smile, to show you the kindness in his eyes and to speak back to you. And I'm like, let's try it. So, you know, what she does, she, she says, okay, Ted Neely, Jesus. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm praying for the integrity of that meeting that, when you call on him, he answers you. That's new covenant promises, right? That's right. For 45 minutes, she told us a, just a stream of what Jesus said to her. So, so I think when we can't find him, usually there's a blockage and I just tell him, I can't find you. And, and so sometimes it's because I just need to picture him. Sometimes it's because I need to breathe a bit first. Um, sometimes I need to be willing to 
hand over something that I am using as a shield from intimacy, like my anger. And I'm like, if I give him that. So in my book, Can You Hear Me? I have a whole bunch of blocks that I've encountered and how to remove those blocks really. And examples of removing those blocks. But um, even if you can't picture him, even if you go, I want you to believe that when you pray, he's there, he's this close to you. And you don't have to find him. He's that he's already there. Um, and we're the ones who probably who, who we might have a hard time finding. So it's a it's a really important question. But I would I would just say, I'm gonna trust you're right in front of me. And I'm gonna surrender those things now. I'm going to imagine you holding your hands out. I'm going to put these things in your hands. And, and um, we got so scared of picturing stuff, but David said this, I, I put, I put the Lord before me all, all the time. And then in Acts chapter two, uh, when Peter's preaching, he quotes David, but he changes the word from, I put him there to, I see him there. And it's ideas, this idea of, I go from active imagination to, into like a real connection. So I mean, give those things a try. Unity seems so fragile right now in some ways, as you noted, and, and cheap versions are out there as well. What robust acts of unity can we participate in? <laughs> the first one is asking that question. Isn't that brilliant and challenging? Um, um, I, I would say, I would say here's a robust act of, of unity and it would be even before you, you know, cross over to strangers or, 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 or whatever. If you know somebody in your life who you are connected with, let's say by marriage, for example, um, between us, <laughs> you know, I have, a, I have a, a niece who's married to a guy who we have just nothing in common and everything that comes out of his mouth, I just think is so abhorrent. And he thinks that of me. And, um, my wife gave us good language. She said, uh, you may not have a common ground, but you have this connection. And so start here, help me understand. And so what we're looking for is what is it in you? Uh, well, Jamie Winship, he puts it this way, identityexchange.com. He's, he, he will go to anyone and he will say, um, I'm looking for a man of peace or a woman of peace. The man of woman of peace is the one who will tell me what they're afraid of. And when he hears what they're afraid of, he says, I can walk you into laying down those fears and you could come into your true identity. He has done this with the Taliban in the Middle East. He's done this with white supremacists. He's done this with um, uh, um, uh uh, black gangsters. He's put together black gangsters in Seattle with white supremacists in Seattle. The ones that were willing to share their fears and ser search their true identity. They actually came together. And now Jamie will go with these two guys into prisons to address gangs there. And it's like, how did this happen? And it's just like, help me understand. What are you afraid of? And moving from there. And uh, you can, you can hear people's, uh, who seem to be real nut bars, if you can get down to what their fears are, then you can say, we could talk to Jesus about those fears together and see what he says. That's like super easy for vineyard people, by the way. <laughs> you vineyard people, just get them, get Jesus talking. It'll be fine. Um, how would we encourage people to go to places that haven't heard of Jesus without sounding like we're doing colonial missions? I think the place to start would be to go learn and listen and build relationships. And before you bother expounding your great news, um, find out what theirs is, find out how they see the world and find out what their fears are and what their dreams are and eat with them and be like ultra curious and whatever curiosity you bring to the table will may may become permission for you at some point to share the hope you have in you and uh and i've just i've just found that really remarkable and and that even some people when they hear it they're like whoa i sure sure can't relate to that um 
but we could be friends, right? And I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> and so I get to embody Jesus to them. And he, Jesus somehow embodies himself in them to me. So. I think one of the great challenges, I mean, it's interesting because I, I, the person who asked that question, Elisha, is somebody who's actually practicing that. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, I think that our, our, you know, our evangelical tradition has, has compelled us to be people who, you know, it's about getting a decision. It's like, we're, it's a transactional thing. We're trying to close the deal and we're not interested in wandering around the, you know, Palestinian desert for three and a half years with a group of guys, you know, we, we, we want to get this done so that I can turn in my numbers. And, and it's, it's that making that shift, that relationship is sharing the gospel is sharing the good news. Hospitality. Hospitality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think in closing, um, Warren has said, I have a lot of fear about Jesus. And that's very strange to me, but I'm also not surprised, right? A lot of people have fear about Jesus because somehow a false Jesus has been preached to them. And I believe the true Lord Jesus of Nazareth is the best thing that is going in. He's the kindest person you'll ever meet. And so I would like to pray a prayer for the whole group about that. Um, because this has been about moving from counterfeits to authentic. Is that all right, Brian? Please, please. Oh, lucky. I, I, I didn't know if he'd let me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, Father in heaven, um, um, I invite my brothers and sisters to come before you now, the true Lord Jesus of Nazareth, the all merciful one. Um, we turn away from every false Jesus that has terrorized us. We let go of bad teachings that have caused us to hide from the kindest person in the universe. We even release those people who did that to us today. We give them to you. We don't want to carry them or their ideas of Jesus in our hearts anymore as a burden and as a fear. And so, um, so I'd welcome all of us just, you know, to come before the true Lord Jesus who revealed the father's love, most especially on the cross. And uh, because he is love, the primary look that you will see in his eyes for you is love. The first and most important message he had when he rose from the dead, peace, peace my peace I give to you. Um, and so if you're weary today of your Jesus fears, if you're weary today of carrying stuff that should have been deconstructed long ago, if you're weary and you just, you just need him to hold you, I welcome you there. Um, see if I can find my surrender prayer or I can just actually say one because I do this every day. Um, <clears throat> here we go. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And in your hearts or even with your hands, I invite you to just hold open your hands and let him lift away the burdens that you've brought, the painful emotions the people you struggle with, the harm you've endured, all of that, whatever, whatever burden has wearied you, we're just going to open our hands at, and, and Lord, we give it to you now. We surrender these things, these people, these feelings, these fears, these resentments, these, um, we surrender self-hatred and self-loathing. We surrender shame and regret. We, sh we surrender anxiety, all these things. We just, we, we offer it to you. And in exchange now, um, Lord, I pray that, that you'd fill these open hands with your peace and with um, renewal and with good news. 
And if you're able, um, you can either imagine looking in his eyes or just look in his eyes, whatever that would be. If you could look in his eyes and saw perfect love looking back, um, I'm going to ask him, what would be the good news today? And as you begin to hear his good news, just go ahead and type it in the chat bar. Lord, what's the good news for my friends who are surrendering today? not going to let you down. You are loved. I give you peace that passes understanding. I'm the lifter of your head. Yep, that sounds like him. Is there anything else? You're not alone. Absolutely. Two not alones in a row. Confirmation. Get three and there'll be goosebumps. Lord, you don't have to enter into the conflict in front of you. Ah, what if you could lean back into him? Um, some of you, if you just want him to give you a hug, he will. Um, that We can always trust him and it's going to be okay. What if that's true? How would we live if we knew that we could trust that in Jesus, it's going to be okay? Oh, that'd be freer. That'd be lighter. Mm. What if, like, what if that's evangelism? <laughs> telling people the good news and, and you could just say, it's going to be okay. And you're, you're being the evangelist, or you could even say, I was praying for the other day. And do you know what Jesus said? Will you? It's like, what? <laughs> he said, it's going to be okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? And so, um, so thank you to everybody. Thank you, father, son, and spirit. Thank you, Brian and Donna. Thank you to the Raleigh Vineyard. I, it's just been a pleasure. And uh, tomorrow's message won't be live. You're going to hear a recorded version about God's dream for a new world. Now we're, we're going to double down on good news tomorrow. That's a good thing. Yeah. So uh, that'll be, that'll be tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, but it will be, uh, it'll be uh, living on the, on the interwebs. So you can catch it whenever you are free and interested in, uh, in watching that. Um, following up on that, get that last part of things. Um, also, for those here in the in the Raleigh area, we're going to have a um, well. No, sorry, <laughs> I'm so used to uh, I'm still stuck in a non Zoom world. So, for anybody that's interested, but especially for Raleigh Vineyard, we're going to just have a uh, a face to face Zoom tomorrow night at seven o'clock for an hour, just for some processing. Um, for those who have been here to be able to, you know, just share things that uh, came to you during that, the, the last three sessions, uh, anything, you know, from the book that's, that's kind of really struck you, uh, just some, making some space to be able to kind of carry this on for anybody that's not zoomed out and would like to, uh, uh, like to be there. So that's tomorrow night, seven o'clock. You can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Raleigh Vineyard. And uh, the Zoom link and everything will be there uh, with a picture that will make it easy to know what you're looking for. And Donna and I, thank you, Brad. Thank you so much for this generous <laughs> gift of your time, your teaching. Hopefully this time next year, you will be here in person and uh, we'll be able to uh, enjoy some face-to-face -face time. That'd be great. Oh, and greetings from my wife, Eden, who, by the way, <clears throat> uh, as of as of this week, is now the pastor, interim pastor of the Bridge Church. And uh, I think I mentioned that before, but um, yeah, she uh, she sends her greetings as well. And 
and uh, I'm glad she let me share. I'm glad she let me come share this time with you or something like that. That was fun. Something like that. <laughs> and now some of you have football games to get to, dinners to go to, you know. But uh, right. anyway, have a good night, everyone. All right. Thank you. Peace, Christ. See everybody. Thanks, you. Thank you for being here. Bye -bye. Ciao. Bye.